I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. Hey there, Parallax News listeners, on this edition of the program, the first in a series of episodes that will be dealing with the Israel-Palestine conflict in light of recent events in that part of the world. First up, Israeli journalist and blogger Yossi Gorvitz joins us to discuss not only the Israel-Palestine conflict and what is happening right now, but also the figure of Rabbi Meir Kahane, founder of the Kach Party, which has been banned in Israel since 1994. Kahane was more or less the proponent for a radical form of Orthodox Judaism and ultra-nationalism that called for the expulsion of Palestinians from Israel. Kahane's sentiments are perhaps best summed up in one of his catchphrases, Arabs get out. Although Kahane was assassinated in New York City in 1990, and, as mentioned previously, his political party in Israel was banned in 1994, his followers live on, and according to our guest Yossi Gorvitz, their influence in Israel has gone mainstream. All that and more on this edition of Parallax Views, and before beginning the conversation, I want to note that when we talk about Mayor Kahane and his views on Jewish legal thought, we should not fall into the trap of treating those views as monolithic within Jewish culture. And, I should add, that should really go without saying. Because the fact is, Kahane met fierce opposition even within the Jewish community itself during his lifetime. And of course, his political party was banned in Israel in 1994. So keep that in mind. Now, let's get on to the conversation with Israeli blogger and journalist Yossi Gervitz. Washington, D.C. Place of stately discourse. Beer knuckle politics and all other assorted forms of scandal. You want the dirt on the capital? Then check out Washington Babylon. Shocking true stories and political sleaze. Edited by Ken Silverstein. WashingtonBabylon.com Welcome to Parallax Views, Yossi Gervitz. How are you doing today? Could be better, but you know, they, we haven't been shot at yet. So they generally shoot after seven, so uh, that's something to wait for. So for my listeners, you're actually in Israel. 
Um, could you give a little bit of background on yourself and uh, the type of blogging you do, the commentary you do, the, the journalism? Okay. Um, I'm 51. I come from a religious background. I'm a former Yeshiva boy. Spent uh, two years in Gaza in the first Intifada as, a, as part of my military service. Began writing sorts of blogs and later in none news uh, in the 90s and early, early 2000. Uh, and um, then I started working with uh, human rights organizations, which I've been doing for the last uh, decade or so. I started my blog, Friends of George, about 15 years ago, about three days before the Second Lebanon War. Of course, we didn't, I didn't see it coming. And uh, over the years, I know, narrowed the focus of the blog from uh, general um, government fuckery to uh, uh, the occupation and the human rights violations by the IDF and the Israeli government. So for people listening in the U.S., what exactly is happening in Israel and Palestine right now? Because I think, you know, people are trying to sift through all the mainstream media and and all of this. So what is your perspective on what's been happening the past week? And more importantly, I guess, the most important point is what should Americans know about what is happening. Okay, at the moment, there are uh, three, um, three sectors of conflict. The, the main one is in the Gaza Strip, which the IDF is pounding uh, into, into rubble as we speak. I'm not sure about the precise number of people uh, who killed. I think it's about 200, of which I saw this morning, uh, 29% are kids children under the age of 16. That's the main sector. Uh, Gaza, uh, the the Hamas is also firing massive number of rockets into Israel and has killed, as far as I know, about five Israelis. Also caused major damage to property all over the country. The second sector is Jerusalem and the West Bank. In the West Bank, the IDF killed about, if number if numbers from yesterday are correct, eleven people. In Jerusalem, num- numbers are not clear. I'm not sure there were any dead in Jerusalem, um, but the number of uh, wounded is unbelievable, over nine hundred. The mess began last, really began last Monday, officially Jerusalem Day. The border, the border police, which is sort of uh, riot police, stormed the Al-Aqsa compound uh, in the early morning, and they threw stun grenades into the into the main mosque, and also into the uh, women's quarter of the mosque, and that created a, a huge backlash. Hamas announced he will fire rockets at Jerusalem at 18.00, and he did precisely that. I think that's the first time Jerusalem has been shelled in, I don't know how long. No casualties, but panic and uh, some property damage. The first sector is within Israel, within the 45 borders, 48, 48 borders. When Jews and Palestinians have been rioting and at each other's throats for the last week, since Monday. I'm not sure about the number of casualties, the uh, varying reports, at least three dead and dozens of wounded. At, when this began, the right wing began sending uh, militias into the so-called uh, binational cities, people where there is a large number of Palestinians and Jews living in the same place. The main focus was uh, was lead, still is, but other towns as well, Jaffa, Accra, or Accra in Hebrew, 
and this caused phenomenal damage to the concept of uh, coexistence in this country. And I think that's the most damaging front because, you know, we've, we've been fighting the, we're fighting Hamas, but something like this simply didn't happen at least since 1990. So I want to go back to uh, what happened with al and also what is going on in East Jerusalem? Because before uh, the airstrikes and, and all of that, a lot of people were seeing the video footage of Palestinians being essentially kicked out of their homes. Could you talk a little bit about that? What is happening there? Or okay. what was happening there, and what should people know about that? Okay, this would be legal and technical, but we have to do that, I guess. Um, there's no other, way, there was no way around it. Uh, in 1970, three years after the occupation of the West Bank and Eastern Jerusalem, Israel passed a law which basically says that if a Jew lost property, which he or his family had in Eastern Jerusalem and the West Bank, prior to the 1948 uh, war, then he, may, then he may reclaim that property. At the same time, the law forbids Palestinians who lost property in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Israel proper from reclaiming their property. Much of the Palestinian property within Israel has been confisc- confiscated by the government in 1950 and 1952 and redistributed to uh, Jews. What happened is when the, during the 1948 war, several parts of Jerusalem changed hands. All of the Palestinians in the West City fled and all of the Jews in the Eastern part of the city were either fled or taken captive and then released. The property of the Palestinians in the west, uh, west, uh, western part of the town was taken over by the government and redivided, often at very small prices. The Jordanian government, which took over the eastern, the, the eastern part of Jerusalem, gave, uh, well, they had to deal with a lot number of refugees. So they gave those refugees the property of the Jews who fled uh, westwards. And those people have been sitting there for 19 years. Then came the law of 1970 and the government began trying to take them out of the houses. Now, this is a government action. The government is funding various societies, associations with uh, nice names and these, these societies are trying to remove about, they succeeded, several, they succeeded several times in removing people. They are now trying to remove about 200 people from their homes. In order to persuade the people there to leave, there are settler enclaves within Sheikh Jarrah, those enclaves are armed and they have security guards and uh, massive border, border police presence. People in Sheikh Jarrah are suffering daily harassment to the point of having stun grenades and uh, gas grenades from other homes in order to persuade them to give up. I worked with uh, a legal NGO, Yeshdin. Frankly, given the uh, 1970 law, the legal chances are not good. And there was supposed to be a hearing in the Supreme Court last Monday. And the government, which kept saying, uh, we have no part in this. This is a dispute between two to uh, private parties, suddenly said, wait a minute, they went to the court, uh, we want to uh, 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 give a position on this case, please postpone the hearing 
uh, for 30 days. And the uh, postponement was granted. But they, because they knew Monday was going to blow up. Monday was Jerusalem Day. They did, uh, settlers were threatening violence. They wanted to, everyone was looking at Jerusalem. They wanted to kick the can down the road. They did. Now, uh, what will happen? Unless the government decides to pressure the court to grant them more time, which the government is practiced at, and the court generally does, there will be a hearing in 20-something days, and the law is clear, and there will be an evacuation. Now, what do you make of the airstrikes and what is happening right now in terms of what effect is it going to have on politics in Israel? Is there another way that situations like this can be resolved? I mean, I think in the U.S., the common refrain we hear is uh, Israel has a, a right to defend herself. And, you know, if these civilians get hit in airstrikes, it's just uh, an unfortunate uh, event. How would you respond to that kind of thing? I think it's uh, it is really propaganda. Look, the number of Palestinian children killed in Israeli attacks on Gaza, and we have enough statistics on this, hovers about 25%. We have uh, enough data from Kaskled, from, I don't remember what they called in English the uh, Tsukaitan, the 2014 operation, and today. Generally, it's, it's about 25-26%. Today, it's a bit higher, 29%. If you are an attacking a densely populated civilian center, and you know there will be 25% casualties among children, then this is a crime no matter how you look at it. It's not, I'm not saying those pilots want to kill children. They don't, but they don't care. They drop the load and people die. And when you are using high explosives in an urban setting, you are responsible for what happens. And you, the, the generals knew, the government knew, everyone knew there will be massive casualties. The IDF spokesman last Wednesday, I think, maybe Tuesday, said that we are going to uh, uh, a larger attacks and uh, if uninvolved uh, civilians get hit, then so be it. I hope they quoted back at him in, at the Hag. But what we're seeing, this is one part of the war crimes. The other part is the destruction of Gaza's infrastructure, particularly the electric, electricity and water uh, infrastructure, which has been going on for years. This means last year, they, the, the UN estimated only about 20% of Gazans have access to uh, pot to drinkable water. Now we have to remember because it's hardly ever mentioned in the uh, Western media. The majority of the Gazan populations are minors. The average age, the, the median age, in the Gaza Strip is something over seventeen. Okay, we're bombing minors. We are destroying the, uh, the water, and we know many, many of them suffer from diseases related to uh, waterborne diseases. And this has been going on for 15 years. The siege began after Hamas took power, before they launched any rockets into Israel. And at first, and until the Marmara in May 2010, the attack on the Mavi Marmara, Israel, Israeli generals calculated the numbers of calories 
gazons have in order to prevent starvation, but not allowing them to, you know, live too freely. They uh, deprive the population of various sorts of foods. I, I can't remember the list, but at the time it, it was quite famous. Um, for instance, you couldn't deliver chocolate to Gaza. You couldn't, you couldn't deliver toys. You couldn't, you couldn't deliver printing paper, for fuck's sake. Um, some of those restrictions were removed after the Marmara. Some of them are still in force. For instance, you cannot deliver into Gaza, even today, vehicles or wireless technology. Since you mentioned the issue of civilians, another thing that we often get here in the U.S. media is it's Hamas's fault when these civilians die. They're launching these rockets and endangering their own civilians by doing this. I, I just wanted to get your response to that. And also the other issue coming up in the U.S. media a lot is look at what is happening to the Israelis. They're ha having to shelter in place. I just wanted you to be able to comment and respond to those points. Okay. What Hamas is doing is a war crime. R launching rockets at civilian population centers is a war crime. Hamas's rockets are um, non-distinguishing weapons. They are accurate to a radius of about two kilometers. And they are, any way you look at it, it's a terror weapon. Okay. It's not an accurate uh, military, military guided missile, it's a rocket. Pretty primitive, often, often misses, and the point is terror. That being said, when the IDF using precision munition is bombing Gazan population centers, the IDF is responsible for its own actions and I don't think it can hide behind Hamas. You are using deadly weapons against a population composed mostly of minors. There is no way get of getting around it. Even before the bombing, the, the, the uh, Israeli Navy has been shooting at uh, Gazan uh, fishing boats, and they've been, been using the... Uh, uh, Fishing is a main um, source of uh, food and income in the Gaza Strip. The IDF changes the, uh, the limits of how far the, the boats may go from 12 miles to generally 6 miles, sometimes 3 miles. And for the last week, no fishing at all. If a boat... If an Israeli boat's captain believes a fishing boat is crossing the, crossing the threshold, which of course is not marked, then he, his procedures are to open fire on that boat. They're using uh, live ammo and water cannons. There are few casualties because they aim at the boat, not at people but there are casualties and they've been destroying boats. In, in some cases, they've been conf confiscating boats, taking them to Ashkelon. So Israel has been monitoring and bombing and shooting at the Gaza Strip almost daily since uh, 2014, probably earlier. Most of those, most of the, of the fire does not cause, does not kill people. It wounds, so nobody records it. Nobody knows it. But it happens all the time, almost daily. And when you look at what happened in Al Aqsa, throwing stun grenades into the mosque. I don't see how Hamas could have, you know, stood aside. 
they have their own population uh, and their own, their own base to comfort. Also, I mentioned having to shelter in Israel right now, and I'm, I'm seeing some people in the U.S. media, sort of op-ed columnists and pundits, mm -hmm. say, look how horrible this is, and, you know, don't talk about the Palestinians. Look at the uh, suffering of Israelis who are having to shelter right now. I, I want to... I want to get you to maybe respond to that because I think, you know, the, it's it's horrible that people have to shelter and whatnot. But I don't think we have to use that to say the suffering of Palestinians doesn't matter. And I actually find it offensive that there's pundits in the U.S. doing that. Well, I'm quite used to that. Uh, look, uh, like many other veterans, I suffer from a sort of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. It's not fun being shelled. Okay, my cat is post-traumatic. He hears those sirens and he never mind. It's horrible. Nobody should, nobody should live like that. But that being said, and of course it's a war crime. That being said, Israelis have shelters. Gazans don't. Israel prohibits the uh, uh, the importation of uh, uh, materials which could be used to build bunkers, and technically a shelter is a bunker. So they don't have anything anywhere to shelter. And it's a two, two million population, most of whom have done nothing to anyone. Hamas well, if you uh, if you grant uh, some freedom of uh, estimates, may have twenty thousand people in its ranks. That's about one percent. The main reason that I I wanted to have you on the show, and this this to me is a really important issue, mm -hmm. the Israeli right wing. So, for Americans that may be ignorant of all the the politics. In Israel, could we talk about the Israeli right wing and how it doesn't seem like there's really a very strong Israeli left, at least within uh, the the sort of parliamentary system? Mm -hmm. well, what precisely do you want to know? Well, what is the, the Israeli right? How far right is it? Just a basic outline of the, the issue of the Israeli right? The, the majority of Israelis would be considered right-wingers to extreme right-wingers by European standards and right-wingers by American standards. We're talking 60%, maybe more. I'm referring to Israeli Jews. Israeli Palestinians are uh, outside my competence. I don't speak the language. The mainstream right... Uh, I think the, the, the mainstream Israeli right-wing has a problem because it ran out of options. For years of saying we can continue the occupation, because Israel is heavily invested in the occupation of the West Bank and uh, Jerusalem, and nothing will come of it. Nobody cares. We can, we can handle anything. But as years turn into, into years, they have to keep running to stay in the same place. We have John Oliver now speaking about war crimes. We have people speaking, uh, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez speaking about apartheid. That never happened before. So the mainstream right wing is in a problem. They, they don't have a solution. The extreme right wing has a solution. And it basically is ethnic cleansing. We have Bezalel Smotrich who is the leader of the, um, they call themselves now the Tzionud uh, the Zionist Religious Party. And he advocated giving the US and Palestinians three options, either to flee, use, use it on the, on the, use a Talmudic story about the options uh, Joshua gave the, uh, seven people when the early Israelites conquered the country. One was to flee. 
the other was to surrender and become enslaved, and the third was to be killed. And he said that they should be given those options. Either they would flee, they would become less than citizens, or they will all, the IDF will know how to deal with this. Now, according to Israeli law, that's uh, advocating for uh, genocide. And advocating to genocide is a crime punishable, still punishable by death. Uh, I accordingly sent a letter to the prosecution and asked them to begin procedures. Uh, they never came back to me. Smotrich is the, uh, how to, put, to say it, the so-called legitimate face of the extreme right. Other people are saying it plain and simple. Kill the Arabs, death to Arabs. And that's where the mainstream right wing is in a problem because they don't have a solution. They cannot offer citizenship to the Palestinians in the West Bank, not to mention Gaza, because that would totally change the, uh, uh, the structure of power. And as the numbers of Jews and Palestinians in the former territories of the British Mandate are very similar. This will no longer be in any shape or form a Jewish state. So what do you do with them? If you're a mainstream right winger, you say, let's talk about something else. If you're an extreme right wing, you will, you will talk at ethnic mainstream, and they do. So, that brings me to the issue of, and I guess we'll have to get into this a little bit for my mm -hmm. listeners that may be unfamiliar, but this ideology of Kahanism, which I think people would say wasn't the, the main Kahanist party in Israel basically banned. And yet you have people like Itamir ben Giver who are you know, open Kahanists. Mm -hmm. So how did no, that? No, 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 no. Okay. Maybe would Bilger would deny that. Okay, he okay. Not say he's a Kahanist, he would say he's a supporter of Kahana. Okay. Therein lies the legal difference which allows him to be elected. I see, I see, I see. So for my listeners that are un unfamiliar, who was Kahani? Mayor Kahana was an American Jew. Um he came into he came in, uh, to Israel in the late seventeens after being involved in a bombing. Um, I'm not sure precisely what the target. Anyway, they killed a person, and uh, and he fled. Uh, he led the uh, Jewish Defense League, which was considered still is, I think, I'm not sure a terrorist organization in the United States following that bombing. He came into Israel and he formed uh, his own party, Kach, and that means this way, that's how you do it. And he immediately advocated uh, ethnic cleansing, including um, death, if you do not leave willingly. Now, what uh, Kahana did, which was, I think, most, most important, was that he fused racism with halakhaic law. There are strata within the Jewish law, which can be, uh, uh, which can be extremely racist. For instance, uh, um, Kill the best of the Gentiles. Uh, that is, however, usually considered to be uh, empowered only during times of war. But the halacha, the Orthodox law, is very clear that uh, a Gentile can never be uh, uh, equal to a Jew, just as a woman cannot be equal to a man. Kahana re reframed much of the Israeli racist uh, talk into religious law. So when they came, after he was elected, the Knesset uh, enacted an anti-racism law. 
However, since actual anti-racism law would get almost any orthodox rabbi in trouble with the law, they left an opening. They said that religious discussions and uh, the uh, explanations of religious uh, problems will not be considered a violation of this law. What happened in, in practice is that you have constitution, constitutionally protected hate speech as long as it's religious. Now, don't get me wrong. This this uh, religious protection does not imply to does not uh, apply to imams. They still get persecuted. And uh, as the Israeli uh, population became more and more religious, it used to be mostly secular. The change has been swift. It's happened in the last few years. Um. Those parts of the halakha became more and more discussed. That's what young people discuss. Many of the Orthodox are young. That's the sexiest part of, uh, of halakha you can get. And this is how it became mainstream. Now, Kahana used to say, Every Jew has an inner kahana. And his job is to bring him out. And the Kahanists keep saying, uh, uh, Kahana told you the truth, but you were too, too afraid to look at it. And now it's becoming mainstream. So you, you would say that, that kahana, Kahanism has entered the mainstream in Israel. And, and also I want to note, what, yeah. The the party um, that has Kahana's ideologies, it's the is that's the Jewish Power Party, right? That's the the Jewish Power Party is officially not the successor to the Kach Party because that would make it into a terror, terrorist organization. It's a new party uh, composed of former Kahanists. Um, and the, the Supreme Court keeps splitting those hairs. Um, some, some of the people couldn't get elected because they were actually involved in terrorism. But Ben Gvir, ben -Gvir managed to slip. But you, you would so say it, that this has entered the, the sort of mainstream. That was the main point I wanted to get to. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. Kahanism is now mainstream in Israel. Don't get me wrong. Many people still oppose it. But uh, if you reframe the situation, for instance, if you ask uh, Yair Lapid, the leader of the opposition, what is his plan for the uh, uh, West Bank? He will tell you he does not have a plan and does not believe there should be a plan. There's nothing to do about it. So, Basically, what he's saying is option two. The Palestinians will remain enslaved. They will not become citizens, and the occupation will never end. Killing is a bit too brutal, and we will not speak about it openly. I, I think he will, actually be he will actually be horrified. But keeping millions of people without civil rights and deprived of most of human rights is okay with that. That's option B. Option one was flee. Option B was remain enslaved. Option three was get killed. Option B is fine with the leader of the opposition. So yeah, it's mainstream. So then, okay. go on, go on. Okay. I, I used to refer to uh, the Jewish militias in the West Bank and the IDF as the official militia and the unofficial militia. And the, the official militia, the IDF, terrorizes Palestinians much, much more than the unofficial militias do, because 
the IDF has the manpower, uh, it is more organized, it has heavier weapons, and it has the support, it has the full support of the government, while the unofficial militias have the um semi semi support of the, of the government. So uh it's horrible if ununiformed militia enter a Palestinian house and uh, beat uh, the people. But it's general practice when the IDF enters the house and beats the people. So before we wrap up, uh, since I mentioned Itamar uh, Ben Giver, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names here, I feel like the ignorant American, but uh, could you tell my listeners a little bit more about him? Uh, because he is a member of the Knesset, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is. And he's been trying to get it into the Knesset for 20 years, I think. Um, he was a uh, follower of, of Kahana. I may be liable to uh, libel suit if I uh, say it otherwise. He keeps denying it. He, as a young man, he attacked Prime Minister Rabin's vehicle and took off the symbol, uh, the, the Mercedes, uh, you know, sign on the vehicle. And he said, as we got to the, as we got to the car, we can get to Rabin himself. Several weeks later, uh, Rabin was assassinated by a Kahanist supporter. And this made uh, Ben Gvir uh, famous, infamous, depends on how you look at it. He is a very shrewd lawyer. I've seen him in court. If he were inclined otherwise, he would be one of the best uh, civil rights, human rights lawyers in the country. He represents uh, Jewish terrorists and Jewish militiamen. He does so very well. He's smart. I once saved him from being, uh, uh, he was constantly harassed by the police. Uh, at one point, the uh, uh, a policeman attacked his dog, Chompy. So he sued and got got compensation for the attack on his dog. And I asked him, "What is he going to do with the picnic?" You, you uh, cut out there for a second. You you said you asked him what, and then it cut out. Could you repeat that? Uh, I asked him what did he intend to do with the money? It's about 25,000 shekels, about $8,000. Um, and he said he was going uh, to buy uh, uh, more food for Chompy. He's very clever, excellent communication, um, and can be very, very, uh, very, very ruthless. Um, I want to save him from, from an arrest, from a false arrest. Uh, I stumbled on it as, really, as I was living in a demonstration. Uh, I think it's dangerous, but I think it's dangerous for the same reason Kahana was. He is normalizing their ideas, he is making them mainstream, and he's very good in front of a camera. So I, I really want to drive that that point home. Sh- should this be a concern um, that he is in the the Knesset? Uh, you know, what what does it mean that that he's in there? I think it means it means little, except that he now has um, he has a bully pulpit, and he knows how to use it. And now, of course, it's perfectly legitimate for every uh, TV studio to uh, get him on a show. Because, you know, he's a member of the Knesset. He's legitimate now. And I guess, what's the response been in Israel to things like the uh, Betsalem report, uh, the, the Israeli Human Rights Group that just released a report, and the Human Rights Report, Human Rights Watch report um, concerning you know, basically saying that there's apartheid in parts of Israel. Uh, what has the response been to that? And how does it play into all of this? I think most Israelis 
didn't hear of the Bessel report or the human rights report. And if they did, they would say that it's uh, anti-Semitic propaganda. But I read both reports. I read the, the Bessel report deeply. The, I, well, I skimmed the, the human rights watch uh, report. I think they're well argued. And they make strong points, even if you don't agree with all of them. I will also point out that Yeshdin, um, I used to work for them, uh, also published a report about eight months ago, which said the, that an apartheid regime exists in the West Bank. The Bezzelo report and the Human Rights Watch report uh, extended the apartheid regime to all territories under Israeli uh, uh, control, both, of, both official and effective. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, Israeli Palestinians still have some rights, even though they are uh, discriminated against, no question about that. But I don't think it's actually a, there's any question about apartheid in the West Bank. Most Israelis will deny it automatically. Uh, well, <laughs> When I, when I used to work for Yishdin and I was writing their blog, I was often cautioned not to use the apartheid word. That was four years ago. Um, and I think it can, at least in the West Bank, it can no longer be denied. So then the, the final sort of point here, and the question I want to ask you is, what can sort of be done um, at, at this point? I mean, is there uh, an Israeli left that can combat this sort of right wing in Israel? Uh, is there anything that can be done to ease these tensions and see that there's more justice and, and mm -hmm. you know, coexistence between peoples? Okay, a few comments on the Israeli left. It's, it's, it, it is in something of a death spiral because most of the people hate Netanyahu so passionately, uh, the just not BB crowd, anything but BB crowd, they went and voted for center parties. Now, our center parties would be considered right-wing parties in most European countries, and I think also in Europe. As a result of this, I think it's, uh, well, I'm, just, I'm looking forward. I think it's a huge mistake. And that's why the Israeli left has, was, was broken. Many of its people, about 15 seats, moved to the center because they want, they want Netanyahu out. And they, and they don't think the left parties can do that. I agree that the left parties can do that on, on their own. Not, not, no question. As a result, uh, the only way this can end is with massive international pressure on Israel. Boycotts and sanctions. This will not change in any other way. Israel is not paying a fair price for its occupation. Most of the time, you know, it's nothing happens. Everything is normal. We invaded 10 families' houses last night. That is the average of Palestinian houses raided during the night. But nobody hears of it. Unless we kill someone, it's not reported. You can wound 60 people and it will not be reported. It's not news. So I think that Israel will stop the occupation only once the international community forces it to, makes the price of the occupation too high. Uh, so write your congressman and write your senator and please tell them to stop supporting the IDF. Start with that. Cut the military aid to Israel. You do that, and people people here will go bananas, because we cannot exist without that. 
I think in the U.S. there are a lot of people that feel very strongly about what is happening um, right now. There's been a lot of protests here. Um, but I also know people that say, I, I really don't want to speak up about this because I, I don't I, I don't want to be accused of anti-Semitism. Um, how do you what would you say to those people that are afraid to speak up because they think, oh, if I criticize Israel, does that make me anti-Jewish? How would you what well, would you tell um, them? I understand the fear. Um Myself as a safe as, as an automatically labeled self self hating Jew, uh, I don't much care for that. Uh, you can't call me anti, an anti Semite. You can try, and I, and I will laugh at you. I understand why people over there are afraid of it. Anti uh, anti Semitism has been weaponized against uh, crit, uh, critics of Israel, and I and I say to you, look, we all know what it is. We all know it's a sham. If you want someone to vouch for uh, uh, your bona fides as a non-antisemite, call me. I'll do that. Speak up for what you believe, because otherwise this is not going to end. You're, you're, they're using soft terror against you, just as they're using hard terror against, the, uh, against Palestinians. Don't let the terrorists win. Well, I want to thank you, Yossi, for coming on. Parallax views. If there's anything else um, you want to say to my audience, because like I said, this is, I think this is a very important issue and, and, you know, people do need to really stand up. So I want to give you the closing comments. Comments. The United States, whether it wants to or not, is involved in what happens in the West Bank and Gaza for the simple reason that it funds the IDF and arms it. American tax money is being used to terrorize Palestinians, to ethnically cleanse them, and to bomb them. Now, this isn't Vietnam. There are no American combat troops involved. But as an American taxpayer, you do share some of the blame, just as I will tomorrow when I will file my tax reports uh, for the last two months. You are... Respons you, you share a responsibility. You're not responsible, but you share a responsibility. And as an American citizen who can speak to American uh, uh, lawmakers, I think it is your civic duty and moral duty to do just that. To let, th there is a huge connect from what I, see, what I see in the polls between what the American public thinks about Israel Palestine and what American lawmakers think. So it is on you to close this gap, to stop this. And the only way to stop it is to make serious attempts at stopping American support of the of, of Israel. Well, I want to thank you again, Yossi Gervitz, for coming on Parallax to use. My listeners can keep up with your work at Mondo Weiss, right? Yeah. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Israeli blogger and journalist Yossi Gervitz. If you happened to enjoy our conversation, then consider following Yossi on mondoweiss.net. As always, let me know what you thought about this edition of Parallax Views by dropping me a line on Twitter at Views Parallax or by email at ParallaxViewsPod at ProtonMail.com. Producers credit shoutouts to Catherine, Nathan, Holland, Mark, Chase, Zach, Omar, Ted, Brian, Gratz, Martin, Gary, Emilia, and Mickey. If you'd like your very own producer's credit on each and every edition of Parallax Views, well, consider joining those listeners in supporting me at the $10 or $15 tiers of my Patreon page at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. That's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. There is also a $1 tier and a $5 tier, 
any amount will help. Your support is what keeps this show going. So if you appreciate the work I do, one, five, ten, fifteen dollars doesn't matter. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Again, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say "Don't do it," just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing it like crazy. So you know we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff, it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.